my goodness. Well, wherever you are, whatever the weather, thank you for joining us on this day. I hope some of you have sunshine because we certainly don't here. So um, thank you for taking the time to join us for this Access Science faculty panel and Q&A. My name is Kaylin Creason. I'm a librarian with McGraw-Hill's customer success team. Um, so if you ever have questions about making the most of your subscription, I'm the one to reach out to. Again, my email is in the chat and I'll share it at the end as well. Also joining me today is Hilary Maybaum, our executive editor of Access Science. Yes, giving a brief wave. <laughs> um, as well as we have today our fabulous panelists. You'll notice we're still waiting for one of us to join, just some technical issues, of course, because I mentioned them, so that's why we're having them, right? But that's okay. Before we get started, I am going to mention some housekeeping. So this webinar is being recorded. You will get a link to the recording probably tomorrow. Things have to kind of get prettied up, and then we'll send that out. Uh, you are muted. I can assure you you're muted. Your camera is off. No worries here. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the session, please do as your fellow attendees have already done and utilize the webinar chat. You can also use the Q&A. I'm more likely to see the chat than the Q&A, so I recommend that direction. And again, if you have any technical issues, you can use the chat or you can email me at kaylincreason at mheducation.com. All right, so that's the housekeeping. The one next thing before I introduce our panelists, there's one other thing that bears introduction if you're not familiar with it already. And that is, of course, Access Science itself. So I believe most of you are familiar with Access Science, or I should say you're at least subscribers to Access Science. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you again for attending today. But if it's been a while or you just need a brief elevator pitch, uh, let me tell you about Access Science. So Access Science from McGraw-Hill is an authoritative and dynamic online resource that contains incisively written, high-quality educational material covering all major scientific disciplines. So that content's going to include articles, news stories, editorial briefings, videos of various types, biographies, and as of 2022, full-text books. I'll show you the site briefly at the end of our Q&A today, our faculty panel today. Um, but just a few more things about that content. All of it's based on factual original literature and written by identified, acknowledged subject matter experts, including thousands of prominent scientists and engineers, 46 Nobel Prize laureates, and dozens of Franklin Award winners. But if you need an even quicker spiel, the goal of Access Science is to present trustworthy scientific and educational material in a way that's engaging and accessible. So access science makes science accessible. <laughs> and to speak on that today and how they use it in their curricula, we have our fabulous experts. All right, so here are your experts today. Let me give them a brief introduction before they tell you about themselves. So first, we have Dr. Steve Thurgison, Professor of Environmental and Occupation Health at uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. So Dr. Thurgison, PhD, MSPH, CIH. He is a Professor of Environmental and Occupational Health at Brigham Young. Prior to working at BYU in 2008, before that, he worked in, uh, for nine years in various occupational and environmental health settings in both the public and private sector. He's also a certified industrial hygienist and EMT, an active member in Workplace Health Without Borders, an organization with whom he mentors and consults with other occupational hygienists and provides occupational health training worldwide, and a past chair of the International Affairs Committee of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. For the past 20 years, Dr. Thurgison has authored First Aid, CPR and wellness books, including the Wilderness First Aid, Emergency Care in Remote Locations, and Wilderness First Aid Field Guide. All right. Our second expert today is Dr. Susan Dalterio, biology faculty at the University of Texas at San Antonio. I think we already mentioned San Antonio with those wild winds right now. 
So Dr. Del Terrio received a BA majoring in both biology and psychology at Boston University, an MA in psychology at Assumption University, and her PhD in physiological psychology from Tufts University. After her postdoctoral experience in the department of OBGYN at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at San Antonio, she joined the faculty in the pharmacology department teaching medical, dental, nursing, and graduate students, conducting her research and achieving the rank of research associate professor. Over a 20-year research career, Delterio has published over 70 papers in prominent scientific journals. For the past 35 years, she served as biology faculty at the University of Texas at San Antonio, teaching undergrad and graduate students, where she's currently professor of instruction in the Department of Integrative Biology. As if that's not enough, she's also been involved in drug abuse education at the national and international level for over 40 years and has served as a consultant for the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, providing numerous training workshops for law enforcement, educators, and healthcare professionals. So as you can tell from those two biologies alone, we have experts here who are so engaged with and interested in not just science, but science education. So I am so excited to hear from them today. Um, Jennifer Gotcher has yet to join us today. When she does, I will give her full introduction and bio as well. But in the meantime, I'm gonna turn it over to our main event and let our faculty experts speak. So let me stop sharing my screen for a minute. Hi experts, hi Steve, hi Susan. How are Hi. you today? Hello. Okay. Good to be here. <laughs> yes. So in my notes, I say, now that I've given a brief introduction, but I'm not sure that was brief. You two have yes. quite the incredible careers. Um, and I'd love to hear from you maybe a little more about your expertise or even how you got started in teaching. And then along with that, Access Science. How'd you get started with using Access Science? And maybe a little, can you touch on how you use it today? So a lot of questions, but yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Which okay, one I of guess... us do you want to go first? I'll let yeah. Steve go first if he's still using it right now. Okay, I'll go first. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name was pronounced correctly, Kaylin. Excellent. Steve Thurgison. Um, my background is primarily in occupational health, so the, the health and safety of workers, uh, kind of a chemical safety, radiation safety. Um, and so I've, I've been doing that since 1999 um, and, and worked in, in a various industries for quite a while. And, and I really wish Access Science was around back then uh, because I think it's, a, it, it, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a broad uh, you kind of cast that net very broad and then can get into some specific topics with it as well. So I really like that. Um, I use it extensively in one of my courses uh, called Environmental Toxicology. So this is an applied chemistry course. Um, and I started, I was introduced to it uh, during COVID in 2020. And uh, I, I was really thinking about... Uh, I kind of wanted to go away from a textbook because as we moved online, it was a little bit easier to maybe teach some things uh, virtually and where we could have maybe a reading up on the screen. And so that's where Access Science kind of came in perfectly to where I can pull up different articles. And now that it actually has the exact textbook I was using, it has links to that and the chapters, it, it really makes, uh, it makes it for a great product for uh, me and my students. So go ahead, Susan. Um, okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Um, first of all, I mean, the, I've had limited access, but I did use it as a pilot in my Biosciences two class during COVID um, when it was a challenge to have a large class of 200 students online who either were there or not there, but were hard to keep engaged. And so one of the things I found very interesting is when I used Access Science, uh, when Hillary gave me access, um, they found it really interesting and they asked for more. I mean, I I rarely in my teaching have students ask for more. Um, and what I had done is I actually was in the environmental ecology part of the course, which is the latter third of the course. And um, after going through all the diversity, which means 
file it till it came out of their ears, literally, and they were bored and lost. I mean, they were so happy to have short snippets of interesting things that they actually, I made them write a little bit, just a little, I also had to uh, um, do some assessment of their writing skills. So I just would have them write a couple of sentences on what they found interesting in the particular topic that they chose and why they chose it. And they were they were like, wow, this is really cool. We really need more of this. And so for the last maybe half of the semester, uh, I had students that literally said, I wish you do more grading from that instead of, well, at the time we had OpenStax. I don't want to trash anybody's product. But anyway, it was a very difficult textbook. Now we use Connect, which is McGraw-Hill. And so I don't want to trash that. But I'm just saying the, the fact is they really want bite-sized snippets and they want factual information, but what Access Science provides is actually something even more, and that is links and hooks to get them to read more, to look further. And I don't know how we can do that with a tech. I mean, a lot of textbooks have, you know, a, a page that might have something interesting or newsworthy, but it's very hard to do that in a timely and maybe I'll use the word green fashion, in other words, updatable fashion, like Access Science can. So, I mean, I loved it. They loved it. It's just that, unfortunately, UTSA, despite my efforts, and they were there um, to get them to, to purchase it. But now that all those textbooks are there, I just like you, like you I, I almost drew, because I use in pharmacology, which I teach um, this spring, I use the Lang series cat song book. So, I mean, I use McGraw-Hill and I've used cats around, I've taught toxicology as well at the graduate level, use Cassaret and Dole. And I'm just sitting there going, it's all in one place. I mean, I, I somewhat want to scream that it would make it so much easier for students to find information. Um, you know, unfortunately, I'm not at the, you know, I'm not at that level, um, purchasing level decision making. Um, but anyway, my kids loved it. and They were freshmen. Um, my graduate students would love it, I'm sure, if they had access, because I've used two of the textbooks that are now on Access Science. Thank you. Oh, I love hearing about that usage. Um, can you tell me a little more? Well, Susan, you spoke on this in a really great way about the excitement and engagement you saw from your students. Steve, did your students have any feedback on Access Science too? Um, what did you notice about how they used it? Well, if I could maybe, uh, if we're talking about some integration and, and usage, uh, maybe I can share my screen um, and, and show you how the students are, are able to see it and, and use it. So uh, if you can Please. see my screen here, this is a, uh, you know, we used to use Blackboard and Canvas and, so this is our proprietary learning management system at my university. And I've just opened up the schedule to where you can see, uh, I, I used to teach exclusively using the Cassaret and Duels Essentials of Toxicology. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a little bit uh, difficult for the, the level of student that I teach that. that uh, so I was looking for something simpler um, and, and introduce some of these topics. Um, I start out, obviously, though, with some of the background of toxicology. So here you can see, you know, we're, we're on, on Wednesday, I'm teaching a class on the history and scope of toxicology. And what better way to get there than just click on this link right here, and that will take you, um, it might be a little bit slow as it loads, but that will take you right to the Cass Retinduals textbook that I used to use. So if you have a subscription to this, it automatically opens it up. And you'll see, you know, there is the, the, the students no longer, you know, just by being a student at our university, they have the entire first chapter and all the chapters of the textbook I used to use. And then one thing that I, I, I ask them to keep exploring within all of this. And so you'll see, I'm not going to click on this link to related videos, but students love the videos. Mm -hmm. This goes to a, a YouTube video on the the top five deadly poisons and and so just some additional interesting information for the students you know there's related articles there's some related terms so it's it's really a good um it, it's easy for the students so that's their main feedback is you know i don't have to go 
you know, look for a book in the library. Uh, I can click on that link and it takes me to other things. And then they start doing a deep dive into topics that they want to know more about. So that's um, that's kind of some of the feedback I've, I've got from them. I haven't had any issues other than maybe this is a, a question coming up later. But the only issue I had was early on, we had some uh, some login problems as we were linking our, you know, our university login with the database that we have in our library. Uh, but those have all been fixed. And so, you know, anywhere in the world, our students, whether they might be on a cruise in Jamaica or something like that and missing class, uh, they can easily connect to Wi-Fi and, uh, and, and get the readings right there rather than taking, you know, the big book that I, that we used to require. So the readings are much easier. That's fabulous to hear. And yes, I love that you spoke to the linking issues, which, we don't have linking issues anymore with BYU, which is fabulous. And anyone out there who does use Access Science, um, we can actually set up that connection with your LMS so that it is a very seamless transition, which is what you're now experiencing between Access Science and um, whatever LMS you might be using, whether it's Blackboard, Canvas, or a proprietary one like BYU. <laughs> Um, well, one of my questions, too, but you've already spoken to it a little bit, both of you, is just, you know, tell me more about what you do to encourage your students to use Access Science as part of the learning process. So maybe beyond um, assigning readings, how do you encourage them? And you've touched on it a little with just it seems like they kind of go out and find things. But what do you do to get to encourage them to use that resource as well? Well, it kind of let Steve take this one because, again, I don't have access anymore for my students right now. Yeah, okay. So um, one assignment I actually give my students is, you know, we might be reading. I'll, I'll go back to sharing the screen again. Um, we might be reading about, you know, maybe toxic responses and case studies of regarding the liver. And so I've put some examples of not these aren't chapters anymore from Cassaret and Duels. These are specific things that, you know, are, are, are associated with the liver. And I'll give them these examples. But then one of the assignments is you need to find two, maybe even three more uh, articles in Access Science and pick out the snippet in there that that is concerning the liver in this case. So not only would they read these, which are short, which is what so many people like, you know, it's not, these are not long readings, um, but then they would go find two or three more and say, oh yeah, okay, this, this applies to the liver. And, and it starts opening their mind to all the different things uh, that are applicable in my case to toxicology. So they're start, start, starting to see that toxicology is, wow, it's a part of everything. Mm -hmm. Um so that's that's an assignment that I give on a regular basis. In fact, they have they have that's their first homework that they have due is to find uh, two additional articles based on history and principles of toxicology. I'd love if you both spoke more on that. It sounds like you know it in that experience you were describing. It kind of opens up student understanding, helps them make some connections. What are some other changes in student engagement or understanding or even performance you've noticed since adding access science to your coursework or when you were using it in your online coursework? Um, I mean, you know, even though it was limited use, one of the things I had problems, the students did not understand the connectedness of the different areas of, especially in bioscience too, which is starts with evolution and then goes through all these diverse biodiversity, different phyla, which leaves them cold, and then uh, ends up with some interesting stuff on environmental science and ecology. Um, but they didn't see the connectedness with it. And I mean, just talking, because I taught toxicology for years, just listening to Steve, I'm going, you know, I wanted them to understand why some of this stuff was important, why the plants were important, why some of these animals were important or insects were important. And they don't see the relatedness, but access science not only encourages them to do the linking, but it provides 
I would call, okay, fast and easy information that makes con making connections, I'll call it a no brainer, you know, even for some of my students that might not be the most I don't know. I, I teach two groups of people, med students, pre-med students who are gung-ho about grades, but not always about topic. So they're gung-ho grade-wise, but they are not gung-ho about the material. And so I think it's really important for them to see the connection with medicine because 90% um, of my class is not going to med school, but they think they are. So it's really important for them to be encouraged to kind of figure out what else is involved. I mean, you know, I bring in fisheries and wildlife people because I want them to realize there's other jobs in biology besides med school. Not that we don't need good physicians, but I'm just saying, well, they're not all going to med school. I mean, I got, I've got 120 students in each of my bio classes and they are not all going to med school. So I want them to see how broad biology is, but still where they can use their interest and not give up their passion or find their passion maybe. And I, you know, I sometimes when I'm using exercise, and I, I mean, this is, a, I hope a nice thing to say is, I feel like a little kid who's jealous because when I'm using it, I don't want to put it down. I mean, I have other work to do because I teach four classes, but it's such fun. And I, I really want my students to be able to have fun learning and not think that they have to memorize everything and see the links and connectedness. Because I think if they do, they would understand that biology as a whole ha has more in it than just memorizing processes and different phyla and subphyla, because that is not it. Thank you. You can both speak to this question, but do you think it's that sense of fun or what do you think it is that maybe sets access science apart from other databases or potential resources that you could be using for your classes? Okay, what, what a lot of my students like to do is they, they love to Google things, mm -hmm. but we all know Google gives some, you know, great, you know, great outputs but nothing's really connected. And I really liked how Susan mentioned that connectedness. Uh, and and my students, I even encourage them to see what ChatGPT puts out in some of this. And, um, but in the end, I, I access science, what it does, it puts it all in one place. So for example, you know, I keep going back to sharing my screen, but I think it's it's kind of important to see how, how my students use this is, uh, there were, this was last year, the students, when we were studying the respiratory system, uh, they wanted to know about, well, how, how does vaping affect the respiratory system? And so they looked up these articles and, you know, as you mentioned, you know, whether this is fun or not, but they, they were very interested in, you know, the chemistry and toxicology of vaping and, mm -hmm. and what about, you know, vaping marijuana and, 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 mm -hmm. you know, what is, uh, what is the, the implications of doing that? And so they were able to click on those, read a short snippet about it, but then there's, um, n not just these articles, but then if you go up a little bit higher, we start getting into, uh, well, then they have some of the just the basic questions, like what is an enzyme? Mm -hmm. And so under you know, like this on Monday, we'll talk about the biotransformation of xenobiotics. And so they can they can go back to the basics without, you know, they, they could do a Google search, obviously. But this is a this is a th there's a link right in some of these. that says, you know, when you're reading about biotransformation off to the side, it would say, well, you might want to learn what an enzyme is. Or you might want to learn what the oxidation process is. So it, it ties it back to these very basic principles uh, and the foundational pieces uh, of learning about how, how um, chemicals interact with the body. So not only does it Did open you... it up to this, this broad connection of, you know, we saw the cannabis and we saw the, the, the vaping, but also it, it, it pairs it down to, you know, the foundational pieces of, of, of uh, chemistry and, and our biology. Thank you. Would you click into, could you show us, just like click into that enzyme article so people can see firsthand kind of what you're talking about in terms of, and I'll show this at the end too, so we don't have to do anything thorough. Um, but making those connections, finding those related resources. Yeah. Yeah, so you're seeing, you know, if they just want to read the key concepts, they can they can go over that. This is what the article is going to give them. There's, 
I, I like when the students mm -hmm. jump over to related articles over here. Uh, there's related videos. So it's 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 all right there without having to go back to maybe a jumbled Google search or such a deep dive, you know, where you get layer upon layer in, in maybe a Google search. But you just go back to this main screen and it 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 runs you through all all of that. And you'll see, you know, this one was authored by Daniel Wellner. I don't I guess you can get it from Cornell Medical University Medical College in Ithaca, New York. So you can see these are. These are experts who are writing these um, and and goes through a, a fairly extensive. I've been an author on some of these. And so it goes through a fairly extensive uh, uh, editing process and feedback process. So so that's that's good stuff. Very, very foundational things right here. And then at the bottom, you have your your related primary literature. And that's another thing that students are realizing is Google searches are not taking them to primary literature in most cases. Uh, and they're learning what what do you even mean by primary literature? And and so this this kind of defines it right here at the bottom. We're taking you not just to some web page, uh, but it, it's taking you to the studies and the peer-reviewed journal articles and, and the books where where this science was actually done. Thank you so much. Did you, Susan, did you want to speak to that um, same question of what is it for well, you that uh, maybe sets? Oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, you know, I guess, that, you know, unfortunately had limited time to use it with, but one of the things that I think is really important about this site is what Steve just mentioned, is that you've got snippets of information, but you also have detailed information. You, I, I also think the video links and the news links are just essential because frankly, I think sometimes students don't realize two things. What Steve just said, that primary research really means that this has been tested, not by one person or in one study. I mean, I just think of Prevagen, I'm not gonna knock them, but anyway, Prevagen commercials, they now have said a clinical study, which I don't even wanna go there. But um, the fact is, I think students need to understand what it means to do scholarly inquiry. And while Google does have a scholarly inquiry function, um, it's not terrific. Um, but at least it's there, but most students don't know to use it. They also don't know how to ask the question. And Google is somewhat dependent on how you ask the question on the quality of data it gives you. So unfortunately, for a freshman biology student, which is unfortunately 60% of my students, um, they're going to have trouble even you know, making the question make sense. And that's not, I mean, access science, they don't have to worry about that because they can just p punch in something and it will direct them to scholarly material with the links that are appropriate. If you Google search it, unless you do it right and ask for scholarly literature, you're not gonna get it. Very true, as I'm sure the entire room can attest to. Um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone here can relate to that as well, to having your students who, you know, Google is top of mind, so they often use Google. Um, but it sounds like you both have taken some great efforts to make access science, if not top of mind, at least like right in front of your students. Like it's right there, it's in your course, easy for them to click on or you promoted it. Um, what? You touched on this a little bit, but I'd be curious in any like specific feedback you've gotten from students. What do they think of access science? Has it replaced Google for anybody or maybe at least Wikipedia? I mean, like because I had limit, you know, the limited use when it was online. I mean, I, I, I don't think they were using it instead of Google search, to be honest, but they found new areas of interest that really piqued their um, willingness to go beyond what we had available in textbook or in my slides. And as I said, at that time, we weren't even using Connect yet. So, I mean, it was really amazing to them that there was something available that had snippets of information, um, good quality primary literature links, as well as really good videos, which they were, they loved. 
I mean, they love the videos. And so that's the kind of, um, re, you know, feedback I got. I mean, I've not been able to use it with uh, my graduate students in pharmacology, even though I, I will use the textbook, um, but they're going to have to still buy it. Um, but I mean, just saying, I, I wish there was more uh, that I could do with them simply because Pharmacology is dramatically challenging for a one semester course, even at the graduate level. And to make it, I, I mean, fun is not really the word, but make it engaging so they understand really where they need to spend their time. Um, yeah, the text, I love, I've used it. I've used Lang for 30 years. I mean, I've used Kesser and Dual. I've used, you know, Katsung. So, I mean, I've used both of those textbooks. They are great, but there's always the but. Um, students just get overwhelmed. They don't have enough time. And I think Access Science provides a really up-to-date, um, scholarly material that gets them not just thinking, but gets them to appreciate what they can do with less time. And I, I think time is a factor. I mean, time is money and time for students. Um, they don't have a lot of time. And so I don't know how else we even get them the information. I mean, no matter what textbook I use, I can't go through it all. So Access science is a sh not a shortcut, but it's a way to engage students so that they can pursue further areas or they can get an idea about the question that they ask answered in a really scholarly way. Yeah, I, I've been an author of textbooks for over 20 years, and I, I know McGraw-Hill knows the current situation of textbooks and where students actually go to find textbooks. Uh, some of them go to great lengths to 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 find the textbook. And if they can't, sometimes they go through the class without ever reading the text. Maybe they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it was just too hard to 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 obtain. Um, they maybe they felt like they just didn't need the textbook. But what I really like this and 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 some feedback I've had from students is uh, I, i'm I'm glad that I don't have to go search for the readings anymore or for the textbook. Uh, it's there. It came with my subscription and my enrollment, or it came with my enrollment at my at, at this university. And so I think that that adds value to the university, especially as they uh, maybe be maybe uh, are recruiting students into it, um, showing them that wow, look look at some of these databases that we have and look at our library system and how 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 rich it is uh and, and broad and deep that's what i mean by and and so you know that's some of the feedback i've had um is they're just they're they're happy they don't have to go searching high and low um when they struggle to find textbooks or or affording textbooks it's just part of the course so for good and bad you know it, it is what it is i guess in this this day and age of you know where where textbooks are actually found. So I'm 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 glad to see McGraw Hill is is moving this way and that I can get I can get cast retin duels with my subscription to Access Science. That's great. I'm jealous. Yeah. <sighs> well, that that's was... probably the point, right? So isn't it supposed to make some yes. of these books a little... go go sell this to your library system? You well, know I. I tried, um, you know, I, I really tried and I'm, I'm not saying I given up, but I mean, I did try and um, basically, you know, I got shut down and I don't, you know, for some reason, um, you know, you know, UTSA is, let's just say administration has not been very friendly to faculty lately, especially our dean. And so I really, it's been difficult. It's just been a very challenging place to work right now. I'm sorry to hear that. I think that that's a common um, difficulty with faculty, maybe not the particular situation at UTAS, but certainly the, we love this resource, we want to keep this resource, but all the other departments want to keep their resources too, right? Mm -hmm. You've always, from the library perspective, you've always got the shrinking budget mm -hmm. and the expanding cost of EU resources. Um, so to that I mean, I'm lucky I got them to agree for biosciences one and, and two, which are the introductory bio courses. I'm the one that got them to use Connect, McGraw Hills Connect. I mean, and I had to, believe me, I fought really hard and I did win. 
So, I mean, it's not like I won't make effort because we now use Connect in all of our intro bio courses. And so, um, and that's a lot of students. So believe me, you don't need to sell me yeah. on your products. I mean, I oh. know they work. And I'm just saying if I could break a few arms, you know, at the higher level and have them, you know, because to me, everything is on there. Everything. It's like, uh, I agree with Steve. It's like a dream come true. I'm like a little kid in a candy store. Like, wow, look where hell is everything I've ever used. Endocrinology, which I taught. I mean, all the stuff I've ever taught is there. All the textbooks are there. I mean, like I said, I, I look at it and I am jealous. I am just jealous. So, yeah, if I can, you know, at some point find out who even is in charge of what because people are flying out left and right. But anyway, we have a whole nother discussion. Well, that is a very valid challenge to experience as faculty. I want to speak now to student challenges just because like this is a well-rounded webinar, right? Like, yes, yes, have loved the praise on access science, but what are some challenges your students have had with access science and how have you addressed them? Or what's some like, give us the full feedback, you know, like what are some things that can be improved or what are some things you wanted to be improved that have been improved or things like that? You know, I, I mentioned, um, you know, just the signing in and the linking, but that's all been fixed. In fact, for a little while, the students just had, they had their own, you know, uh, specific sign in for it. And, and, but that was based on feedback. Hey, Dr. Thurgerson, we're having some issues signing in and, and getting the read. It's like, okay, let's get it fixed. And McGraw-Hill fixed it fairly quickly. Um, sometimes there's maybe too much information. There, there's, there, there, you know, we've talked about how much information there is, but sometimes it's too much. And maybe they're not seeing the exact parallels. And it's difficult when you teach just maybe an hour long class or an hour and 15 minute class. Um, to touch on the different things that they have. So I've, I've actually asked students, we have a digital dialogue uh, in our learning management system. And so they can, they can put those in there rather than, you know, if, if they don't have time to come meet with me during class or after, or, or in my office hours or after, uh, they can put something in the digital dialogue, uh, which, which is, which is good. They, they don't seem to use, uh, They'd rather use some sort of digital dialogue rather than email. Even <laughs> I find I find email is is uh, it's too slow even for them. So uh, they they like that <laughs> digital dialogue there, or you know, or WhatsApp or something like that. They like that as well. So so I think just that open communication with the students is is very important. You 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 need to ask for their feedback on some of these readings, and and they'll give it to you. So the the times that I've asked for it, they they were readily you know, readily said, yep, we, we like it. It's easy to use. And so, I, and I've mentioned some of the other things that they like about it. Um, kind of in, in keeping with what Steve just said, my, my only comment that I've had from students and I've noticed even my, in my own experience, which is, you know, I spend a lot of time with access science because I'm, I'm reviewing some of the material, but anyway, one of the things that they commented on is it's very uneven in terms of level mm -hmm. and, so um, sometimes, you know, you've got a box that has a lot of really good information, great videos and linkage, but the explanation is way over there. I mean, maybe if you're teaching, you know, a graduate course in chemistry or in, uh, which I do in pharmacology, it might be okay. But even, you know, I, I hate to say this, but my students are better than they were before COVID personally in dealing with them in classroom but they are very much less well-prepared than students used to be. So I have now had to, let's just say I have to go a lot to teach farm. Now I have to reteach some bio one because they don't remember anything. They were either in school during the COVID thing and they don't know what, anyway, uh, to make a long story short, I find that some of them have said to me that they found it complicated. And so I just wonder, how big an editorial issue it would be to to maybe separate I mean give a little bit more information I don't know maybe in the box or in some top part and then not do the Wikipedia thing on the the whole thing you know because even the example that Steve just showed which I I teach talk so I I love that 
But that's overwhelming for some of my students. If they looked at that, they wouldn't read the whole thing. And I wouldn't want them to be turned off. And so I think we there is some fear sometimes that they won't read any of it if they if it seems to be overwhelming. And that's just a comment. Right. That, you know, I had. No, that's great feedback. You don't want to send them down a black diamond if they're only ready for the bunny slope, right? So how do we indicate yeah. to them, hey, this section is a little more advanced than maybe you're ready for? So and maybe it just feedback. requires, you know, a, a statement or a, or a <laughs> heading or something. But I'm just saying sometimes they've said it's just too much. Yeah. yeah. And, and and you know that's that's one reason I was moving away from the even the essentials of toxicology book mm -hmm. is because they were just especially in like chapter three mechanism of toxicity oh know, yeah it's just it's just over their head and so um you know so what I like is is how it's available now and you can click over here and I can say okay yeah there there might be some sections that you can skip uh, so it's broken down into these nice chapters. Mm -hmm. Where before I'd have to say, okay, read page one to two and yes. then skip over to page five. Um, but I can just either verbally or just kind of write it in there. That's, you know, easily that easily done that way. I mean, look at look at the different sections in written in toxic responses of the respiratory system. So I think while I haven't looked at other textbooks in here, I, I believe they're all broken down. The ones that are available are broken down that way. So yeah, I'm with you, Susan. Some of some of this is way over their heads, but but I think the solution is you can go in and pick and choose. Just you know, like we used to do in regular textbooks. Yes. You know, but but it's much easier this way. Yeah, I have trouble with mechanisms and pharmacology, which is the same thing too. So yes, <laughs> I get it. I'm challenged. <laughs> have to well, reteach perfect... physiology. <laughs> That's a perfect tie-in and because it's a tip for, you know, faculty who are using this or considering using this resource for their courses. One tip is that you can sort of pick and choose um, to create your own course text. But what other advice just to this is my last question before I open it up for audience questions and then give you we've seen a little bit of access science. I might point out a couple other things depending on how many questions we have. But just as one last question from this moderated section, what advice or recommendations would you give to other faculty who are considering incorporating access science into their teaching? So you're talking about those who, who already have the subscription and, and have access to it? You know, it can be both. Like, Susan, okay. from your perspective, you, if, I would if just a faculty say, members interested in subscribing, what would you advise them to do to advocate? I but would, yes, the I focus would, is more... Mm -hmm. I Go would ahead. definitely select, you know, I, and I don't want to say senior in that way, but um, I would definitely movers and shakers. And that's the only reason I say senior level faculty in chemistry department and biology department and all the stuff that you have so much on and, and give them a chance to look at it. Because I mm -hmm. think if they saw it, they would be very much enamored of the approach. Um, unfortunately, some of our more junior people, they just don't, you know, they're they're just treading water. I mean, there's no point. Plus, um, m many of our senior faculty, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of senior, but I was just one voice crying out. But as some of our other senior faculty have a little bit more clout because they're tenured, <laughs> and uh, they might end up being able to convince the powers that, that be that this really is a worthwhile product. I mean, not that I didn't try. <laughs> like I said, yeah. I got I got our ex dean to agree to connect, and he now thanked me for that. So I mean, it was that much of a fight, and he now says, "Wow, this was wonderful. The students love it." So it's not that I'm not a good salesperson, but at the financial end, it was a lot harder. Yeah. Well, there you go, everybody. Though all the faculty out there, whether you're advocating for a McGraw Hill resource or some other resource, there are success stories. You can convince your <laughs> upper level teams. Um, but for those of you who are lucky enough to have access science, um, yeah, Steve and Susan, what recommendations, advice would you give them to bring it more into their teaching or increase student engagement with the resource? Yeah, so I've mentioned this before. Well, when, when I started and we had our subscription access science, I, I started with just a couple of articles 
uh, maybe one per topic or maybe one every other topic that that wasn't a textbook reading. It was just, a, you know, a simple article. Um, and, and then I would I would see, OK, how did that go? Um, I I don't think I can track, you know, how many students read that besides just asking the students. But I, I would love to be able to do that to see, you know, how many clicks did it get? That would be kind of neat. I know McGraw Hill can probably do that. But um, so I would start with just that, exactly what I did. I did just a few articles on existing topics, you know, uh, that are of interest, get some feedback and then slowly add more. You know, that's how I started. And now I'm on this particular class. I'm all in access science. So that's all pretty much all I use. I have a few other articles from other web readings, but uh, that that's that's all I do. So now it, we utilize the videos. So I, I would say start start kind of small, get some feedback, and then move into adding more. And then eventually you might you're probably going to find yourself using exclusively access science. Um, I actually well, I deal with students who grades are, you know, the be all and end all in some ways. And so I find I found that they want us to use more assessments, especially low weight assessments. And so I gave them some credit. And but I, I made it in a way that grading was not a challenge. It wasn't onerous. I mean, I made them write one or two sentences, you know, what they picked and what they learned from that particular article and why they were interested in it. And so I just want them to think, I mean, I want them to be able to express themselves and also to think about what importance that has for the rest of their, you know, courses or their career goals or their ultimate goals in science. And, and so um, I, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I find giving them credit. They want credit for it. They want to points or a grade for everything. I mean, they want a grade for evaluating teaching. Uh, you know, they want it. So I'm, <laughs> I, I, I am not a, opposed to actually giving them carrots. And that is giving them a point or two or three, um, especially since we're required because these are core courses to see their writing style, their communication skills. So sometimes I make them do a slide or two and do a voiceover. Um, I'll say, just pick something off Access Science that you're interested in this area under this topic, and then tell me why you picked it, why is it important? Like if it's a phyla, a particular organism, you know, what's its ecological niche? You know, tell me about it. And so, or what's its evolutionary history? And grading is easy because it's not, I mean, as long as they don't write horribly one or two sentences, you know, we just pretty much give them all their points. And so, I mean, if I had access science, I would use it the way Steve is using it. That's my dream. But I mean, even in a limited way, that's what I did with it when I had a chance. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, does anyone from our audience have questions for our two panelists? I'll give you a couple of seconds to type those in the chat if you do have them. Um, and if not, that's okay. I'll move on to a brief demo of Access Science for those who maybe haven't seen it in a while. Uh, let me just vamp for a minute while I wait for anyone to type their questions. But, um, you know, one other, just made a, more of a technical suggestion, but maybe you could come up with a list of universities that use this and send it to some of the universities that don't, and maybe we could get them to think about it. Mm -hmm. Definitely an idea. All right, let me share my screen. And Steve and Susan have done a great job already touching on a lot of things that I was going to touch on, which just speaks to how well they're using it in their courses or previously used it in their courses. Um, everyone should be seeing Access Science. Are we seeing that screen? Yes. Beautiful. All right, so um, I've already given a spiel. You know Access Science by now. It's been the star of the show. Um, most of you who are attending today do have access through your library, so make sure when you first connect to the site to go to that library page, that A to Z list, it's often called, and click from there. One fabulous benefit of Access Science starts with an A. Shouldn't have to search for it too hard on that list of databases you have access to. Um, now, a great thing too about Access Science, the first time you click through that library link, it's going to put a cookie in your browser. It's going to remember you on the same device, same browser for six months. 
So that makes access for you and your students even easier. So if you're off campus, if you're on the couch, if you're studying abroad, if you just go through that library page the first time, the next six months, same device, same browser, it's going to remember you. So, um, and we also have that option to click through from your LMS. So if that's an option that you just want to double check with me is configured right, um, just shoot me an email. I'll check that everything looks good for you so that we can make that access as easy as possible. Speaking of signing in, I totally recommend creating a personal account on Access Science. It is a fully optional feature within the site, but it does unlock some key personalization tools um, like bookmarking, labeling, some good things like that, that I as a librarian have to encourage because they help keep you organized. They help keep me organized. Um, and believe it or not, that is something I need all the help I can get with. So when it comes to, let's say you're doing exactly what Steve and Susan recommend. You're like, okay, my challenge for this week, new New Year's resolution, I'm going to add one Access Science article to my course. Awesome. You have a few ways to navigate site content. And you know what? Maybe you're not adding an article. Maybe you want to add one of those nifty videos or... Um, a biography, we have six different content types. Um, news actually includes a few different content types, but this is the first easy way to get to what you're looking for. So if you're like, yeah, I want to dive into articles. I want to see what we have. We can click into articles. You'll see on this nice little landing page, I've got some highlights. So some popular articles right here and the ability to filter articles by topic. So we touched on articles briefly, but let me take a second pass real quick just to show you again that kind of easy layout that they have. You got key concepts at the top as well as your table of contents, which is relevant if it's a slightly longer article. Also pulled out at the top, you've got your figures and tables. All of these are linkable, downloadable. And then Steve showed the primary literature at the bottom of the page. It lives there. It also lives in its own separate tab. So for that reason, I love to recommend Access Science not just to my STEM faculty, but also to anyone teaching like an intro to college writing course, because we're all trying to really drill into students that importance of primary literature. What is it? How do I find it? And I think having this separate out tab really helps with that. So, of course, here is on the right hand side is where you can find all the related articles. You can kind of go down that Wikipedia type rabbit hole, um, be the kid in the candy store like Susan and sort of see whatever picks your interest. Right. And then up here are my content tools. So we've got citations available in multiple formats. Students love that. I loved that as a student, just like I can copy and paste this citation. Beautiful. One less thing, one more time saving thing, right? You can bookmark content if you're signed into your personal account. Bookmarks are great. I love labels because you can add customizable labels to your content. So I don't know why I'd be adding 3D printing to my bio label, but I certainly could. <laughs> and that just helps me stay organized. Especially for me, if I'm prepping for different instruction, for you it might be for different courses or weeks in a course. Um, one thing I'm excited to show is you can annotate on the site. We have built in hypothesis within the site. And one like kind of cool thing about this, it does require a separate account, um, but Steve was sort of talking about that communication that students like outside of email. Um, so with Hypothesis, what you or your students could actually do is create different groups on Hypothesis, and then they can collaborate and take notes, write questions, etc., just right within Hypothesis. Um, we do have a video on that. I don't have time to go into all of it today, but it really treat, lets students treat the site like a book. So they just highlight with their mouse whatever they want to highlight. Like this little guy pops up. He's kind of hiding right now, but here you go. <laughs> you can click to annotate, add your note or your question, uh, post to a group, highlight, etc. 
You'll see something else that came up when I highlighted text. One of my new favorite additions is the read speaker. So we just added a read speaker to our okay. site. Um, it has a lot of customization available. Uh, it obviously boosts accessibility. It also, I've heard it's popular um, amongst like ESL students or um, students who don't natively speak English. So that's just another use and another benefit. For me, someone who uh, majored in English, it's also beneficial to learn to pronounce some scientific terms. So a lot of benefit to the read speaker. All right. So those were the articles, of course. You can navigate content by clicking different content types. They all have a beautiful landing page like I showed you, you just kind of highlighting some key. There's another star of the day, Casra and Duel's Essentials of Toxicology. But the other way you can navigate content and maybe a more beneficial one for you is to click tell that we're counting down on time here. Um, but in our topics, we have split all of our site content into 18 fabulous STEM topic areas in real slow. You'll see them here. So these are the 18 broad categories that we have. We then split each just for fun. We've been talking a lot of bio and pharmacology. Let's click into math for something different. Um, and so here on the left-hand side, you'll see all the different subtopics available within MAP to get math to kind of help you find what you're looking for. You or your students can search within a topic. And then we've got some highlighted content here as well. So I could click to show all the content in this topic to just see what's available for math. One thing I want to show you, um, we just added in 2022 some full text, not some, we added over 20 full textbooks to the site, such as Casseret and Duels. Those, and as well, in addition to those, we have some upper level science books. We also have the Shams outlines. So there's quite a few of these. They often focus on like a very foundational content area. So for instance, this is college algebra. Um, and these students often use these to really get um, either as like a supplemental resource for understanding a concept or instructors have used them in adjacent with textbooks or as textbooks. But a huge benefit of these and another content type to mention are our videos. So Shams has these solution walkthrough videos. So actually in each video, you're watching a faculty member solve a problem step by step as if it's on a whiteboard. And that's just loads of help, obviously, if you're struggling to understand a concept or want to work through some additional problems on your own. Oh, there's so much more to be said about the site. The way, last way to navigate it is, of course, through our smart search. So you can always just, why don't I search for pharmacology here? You'll see some suggested terms, suggested titles, um, but our search is also going to take you to everything on the site. You'll see definitions from the McGraw-Hill Dictionary of Scientific and Technical Terms, and then some awesome content filters over here on the left-hand side of the page. The last one I'll show you is our news content type. Just because these, when we talk about curiosity and fun on the site, our news and editorial briefings are a really great way to bring Access Science content into, like, to make those connections of how are things relevant today. So we have different news stories or different editorial briefings on scientific developments, um, new, what's new in science. And often they can be, none of these are, I'm not gonna use the word fun about any of these here at the bottom, but sometimes they can be fun or interesting or just make that connection to real world science in kind of a different way. Oofta, so that was a super brief showing of Access Science. For more information, I cannot recommend enough the Information for Educators page. Susan, I know you were talking about kind of uh, students want assessment, right? And so actually within Access Science, our most popular articles have self-assessment questions. The answers are 
publicly available. We make them available to students, but they do kind of have to dig to find them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so good. That's um, good. You can, yeah, right. But you actually could just if there was an article you're considering adding to your course and you know students are going to be looking for that carrot, just take a peek at what questions we have and then what answers we have written out um, if, if you want to make your life a little bit easier in that way. Um, so yeah, so that is what I have, uh, what we have today. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if you do have questions, uh, please reach out to us. Let me share my contact information one more time. And thank you so much again for, um, for joining us. Give me one second here. I know we went a little over, so I appreciate you sticking around if you did. Um, if you have any questions, if you want a demo specific to a course you're teaching or to your institution, my team is happy to do that. If you have any questions for our experts, I'm happy to pass those along. Um, but thank you. Thank you for subscribing to Access Science, for your interest today, and for all you do to make learning engaging and accessible for your students. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Hillary. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank all right. Goodbye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.